Uh, peace and the mercy and blessings of Allah be with you all. Uh, thank you for joining me for this live post uh, in which I discuss Matthew's Gospel. And today we're dealing with chapter 12. So, as usual, I will uh, check your comments uh, from time to time to make sure that everything is okay. And then I will try to answer your questions uh, and look at your comments in detail after I'm done with my main presentation. I also give thanks to those people who share my screen, uh, who share my, my post. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and uh, bless all the people around you. I begin by praising our creator and fashioner, the creator of the heavens and the earth. I ask you, Allah, Ya Rabb, have mercy on the entire world, on the plants, the animals, the fish in the oceans, uh, and in the rivers. Uh, I ask you to bless uh, all of the people who join us and all of their loved ones and uh, make this meeting fruitful for us, so one in which we learn, uh, we grow, and we advance in our closeness to you. So, I will be looking at uh, Matthew chapter 12, and for that I will uh, use the assistance here of uh, BibleGateway.com. So I go to Bi BibleGateway.com, and I notice they have the New American Bible here, the revised edition, so I will work with that. I tried that last week, and I loved it. New American Bible, um, it's uh, one of my favorites. I like the translation. It reads very smoothly, and I like the um, comments as well, so, uh, extensive notations, uh, and we see those notations here on the Bible Gateway page as well. So, to begin the reading then, chapter 12 uh, of Matthew's Gospel, Picking Grain on the Sabbath. At that time, Jesus was going through a field of grain on the Sabbath. Uh, his disciples were hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, See, your disciples are doing what is unlawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? How he went into the house of God and ate the bread of offering, which neither he nor his companions, uh, but only the priests, could lawfully eat. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests serving in the temple violate the Sabbath and are innocent? I say to you, something greater than the temple is here. If you knew what, is, uh, what, uh, what this meant, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the, the, these innocent men, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So let's pause there and uh, reflect on what we have read. So Jesus is passing through at the grain field and it's a Sabbath day and on the Sabbath day you're not supposed to pick anything, you're not supposed to do any work. Now the, the Jewish rabbis have had to exercise their minds to differentiate between what is what qualifies as work, like how much can you do and that would not qualify as work. And in, in modern times this can um, uh, take on some interesting uh, dimensions. For example, uh, one may not be able to turn on the stove during the Sabbath. So um, this is on one interpretation. And so you may have, uh, you can turn it off because obviously that is uh, to um, repel some possible harm. Uh, but uh, to turn it on would be deliberately to do some work. Uh, so th there are actually stoves uh, which sell with a Sabbath function, and I don't know all of the details of how that works, but I, I could only uh, imagine that that is for the purpose of getting uh, around this difficulty of you know not being able to turn on the stove during the Sabbath. I was invited to participate w uh, with a Jewish friend uh, in a meal um, on on the, the start of the Sabbath. That was on the Friday evening, and... Um, so what I understood that is that uh, they could, you know, warm up everything they need and so on before the Sabbath actually starts, which would be sundown on Friday. And they could turn on the stove uh, uh, before the Sabbath, uh, but not to turn it on after when, when the Sabbath uh, starts. So uh, you, you, Jesus then obviously is living in a milieu in which uh, it, it is natural for people to observe the Sabbath regulations. And uh, some of them are complaining, okay, your disciples are going through the grain fields, picking the grains, and they're not supposed to do that. Uh, so he gives an explanation, and his explanation shows that he's still following the law. 
he is still following the Torah, but he's trying to show that there are exceptions and one should see the spirit of the law. Uh, so the disciples at yes, but David also did similarly when he was hungry, he and his companions. So Jesus isn't doing something new. He's showing that he has a proper interpretation here uh, of, of the scriptures and of the regulation. Uh, so only the priests could have eaten the, the showbread, but David and his companions ate it while they were hungry. Moreover, he's, he points out that on the Sabbath, the priests serving in the temple violate the Sabbath and yet they are innocent. So how they violate the Sabbath, Jesus does not mention, and that would be interesting for us to find out, but uh, I don't know the answer to that. What do they do? But obviously they have some kind of exemption, uh, and probably that goes with seeing the spirit of the law. It was not there to uh, put difficulties in the way of people. It was there for, for the benefit of human beings. So Sabbath is a day of rest and uh, people need that. Otherwise, work, work, work all of the time. People end up with more stress and so on. Uh, we, we need some quietude in our lives. And this is uh, how the Sabbath has helped people in the past. So there is a day of relaxation, of cessation of work. You can focus on spirituality and, and so on. Uh, so he's saying, okay, if you understood um, what I'm talking about, then, you know, you would know that uh, somebody greater than the temple is here. So you have the temple and it's all of, all of its regulations. And now you have a prophet of God who has come here with uh, a mandate from God to teach certain things and to enact certain practices. Uh, that is greater than the temple itself. So you, you can't be holding on to the temple and its laws uh, and um, at the same time, you know, not listen to this messenger that has come from God. That seems to me to be his clear message here. And then he says, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So referring to himself as the Son of Man. Now, we, we have already indicated that there are instances where Jesus seems to be speaking about someone else coming after him who is designated as Son of Man. Uh, but for the moment, we can grant that uh, in the present saying, Jesus is referring to himself and saying that he is Lord of the Sabbath. So what does that mean? Uh, some people may want to stretch this to mean, oh, so he's Lord, that, that means he's God. But no, it's just Lord of the Sabbath. That means he has some authority over the, the Sabbath regulations. And as a prophet and messenger of God, he could be delegated that authority from God to explain to people uh, how the Sabbath should be kept and, and what are the uh, possible um, uh, you can say modifications of the Sabbath regulations uh, that could be implemented. So nothing here out of the ordinary, nothing here shows that Jesus has disregard for the law. Rather, he has regard for the law. Otherwise, he could have said, look, the, the law no, no longer applies. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying, look, I, I, am, I have an interpretation of how to apply the law and I'm following that interpretation and it's a justified interpretation because David did something similar and in fact the priests continue to do something similar as well and uh, it, it, to, to use another saying probably in another gospel they say the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath so what he seems to mean by by that is that the Sabbath is there for the benefit of the people and uh, it is not there for, it, it, like you 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 you, you modify the sab Sabbath regulations in order to fit the needs of human beings, but you do not deprive human beings of their needs because of the Sabbath. So the, the, the Sabbath is made for man. It's not man for the Sabbath. Um, okay, so I continue to read. And before I continue to read, uh, let me look at your uh, comments to make sure everything is fine because I know you will alert me if the sound or videos, uh, the video is not right. And I see that several of you are here offering your comments. I'll look at, at your comments in more detail later on, uh, Brother Muhammad, and uh, come back to Islam, and uh, uh, Brother Dennis, and uh, Brother Salmi. Um, so I'll, I'll look at your comments in more detail later on. And for the moment, I want to give thanks to Al-Hajj uh, Abu Bakr uh, Mustafa, who has uh, shared the stream, and also Brother Muhammad Mustafa, uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing the stream. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll continue the reading for the meantime. All right. So we're at uh, the, the story about the man with a withered hand. 
that's in verse number nine. So reading here from the New American Bible uh, Revised Edition, which I find on BibleGateway.com, here is how it reads. Verse number nine. Moving on from there, he went into their synagogue, and be behold, there was a man there who had a withered hand. They questioned him, is it lawful to cure on the Sabbath? So they might accuse him. Uh, so, so you know, you see what's happening here. They're, they're asking him a question in order to trap him. Uh, so verse number 11, he said to them, which one of you has a sheep that falls into a pit on the Sabbath, uh, will not uh, take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable a person is than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and took counsel against him to put him to death. So you can see here that uh, Jesus is showing, I'm not violating the Sabbath. I have an interpretation of what it means to observe the Sabbath. And it is good to do, like you can do good on the Sabbath. You can't do anything wrong on the Sabbath, but you can do something good. Now, one might say that his interpretation here is stretching things a bit because uh, the, the Sabbath laws as they were, you know, might say, okay, you can do a good deed, but it, yes, uh, don't do any work. And uh, some good deeds involve work, so you shouldn't do any work. But, it, you know, if yes, if you, if you have your sheep falling into a pit on the Sabbath, you would, you would lift it out. So they can't disagree with Jesus there. But they may say, like, you know, this man had the withered hand all his, well, probably for a long time. And uh, you don't have to heal him to today. You could heal him tomorrow. Like, why do you have to do that on the Sabbath day? So obviously, Jesus's explanation is not, uh, is not total. Um, but uh, nonetheless, that's his explanation. But, and his explanation goes to show simply that, yes, I'm still observing the Sabbath. I still respect the, the, the Torah and its laws, but, but I am uh, interpreting it and applying it in a certain way so that we can do good deeds on the Sabbath. You might say then that he is making here a modification of the Sabbath rule, uh, saying that you could actually do good on, on the Sabbath, even though that involves uh, some, some work. But now, uh, verse number 14, the Pharisees went out and took counsel against him to put him to death. So this is an important statement here because many times our Christian friends uh, may say to us, uh, at least those who are Trinitarians, we have people here in, in the room now who are not uh, Trinitarians, uh, but Trinitarians will say, see, um, in John's gospel, they were picking up stones to stone him because uh, he was claiming to be equal with God. Uh, but here you can see in Matthew's gospel and in the synoptics generally, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, that uh, the uh, Pharisees and others uh, were trying to put Jesus to death, uh, not because he was claiming to be God, but because he did things like heal a man on the Sabbath, uh, which means for them that he is violating the Sabbath regulations, which means that they see him as a human being. Uh, who is claiming to be from God, but he is violating God's rules, and therefore he's a blasphemer, and they want to put him to death. So that's their interpretation. By hook or crook, one way or another, they're trying to put Jesus to, to death. So it's not because Jesus claimed to be God. From a Muslim point of view, Jesus didn't claim to be God. And while we find uh, some hint of that in, um, in John's Gospel, even John's Gospel uh, doesn't have Jesus actually claiming that he is God. He uh, speaks in John chapter 17, verse number three, praising God and uh, saying that this is eternal life, that they may know you as the only true God, and they may know Jesus, your messenger, as Christ. So uh, he made a distinction between himself and God. There is God and God's Christ. He's only the Christ, and God is the one he was uh, worshiping. So now we come to the section entitled uh, The Chosen Servant. And of course, all of these sectional headings are not original to the Bible. Uh, this is from the translators. Verse number 15. When Jesus realized this, he withdrew from that place. Many people followed him and he cured them all. But he warned them not to make him known. 
This was to fulfill what has been spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, whom I delight, I shall place my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not contend or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory. And in his name the Gentiles will hope. Now, uh, think about this uh, here very carefully. This is in Mar Mar Matthew ch chapter 12, verse 18, in particular, where Jesus is quoting this passage from the book of Isaiah, and that is in Isaiah chapter 42. Uh, the, uh, God is talking about his servant, and Matthew is saying that Jesus is the servant of God. That, that's the whole point of this um, uh, quotation here. So if uh, if if Jesus is the servant of God, that is a clear indication that he himself is not God. But, uh, rather, he is God's servant. Now we come to the section entitled Jesus and Beelzebul. It's an interesting story. Verse number 22. Uh, then they brought to him a demoniac, meaning a person who is um, possessed by, by a demon, uh, who was blind and mute. He cured the mute person so that they, he could speak and see. All the crowd, uh, is, are there two different persons here? It looks like he cure, uh, cured the blind, the, 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 the mute person. Okay, let's read on. Verse number 23, all the crowd was astounded and said, could this perhaps be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they, they said, the man drives out demons only by the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons. Uh, so you see the reaction of the people. Like here you have a man coming from God and he's performing miracles and this is the response. Uh, now we see that uh, people were demanding of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to perform miracles. And the reply given to them in the Quran is that, you know, the prophets of the past perform miracles, but people did not believe. So if, if people are attracted to good things, then they will see the goodness of the message of the Prophet and they will believe based on that. Uh, but a, a prophet performs a miracle and people might still uh, say, well, maybe maybe it's not God who is doing this. Maybe this is coming from, from uh, the devils. Uh, verse number 25, but he knew what they were thinking and said to them, every king, kingdom divided against itself will be laid waste and no town or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How, then, will his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your own people? So, uh, by whom do your own people drive them out? So, which means that Jesus, in performing these uh, exorcisms, uh, w was not alone. There were others who were performing the exorcisms as well, the Jewish people. And, uh, and, and so, if they were accusing Jesus of performing this miracle by uh, the uh, devilish assistance, then uh, what would they say about their own people? By whose power are their own people driving out the demons? Now, I, I, I want to add a footnote here in saying that, uh, it, you know, there's nothing in the Quran that shows that Jesus drove out demons from, from people, although the Quran is not reticent in re retelling the miracles of Jesus. Many miracles of, the Cor of Jesus are mentioned in the Quran, including the idea that he raised the dead back to life. Uh, but uh, that he drove demons out of people, this is not mentioned in the Quran, interestingly. Uh, now, to continue reading, we're at the end of verse number 27, where it says, Therefore, therefore they, they will be your judges. So, in other words, Jesus is saying to them, uh, you know, talk to your people who are doing similar work, and, and they will tell you whether this work is being done by Satan or against Satan. And Jesus is very clear about that. If I'm driving out the devils, then I, I can't be doing that by the power of the devil. It would mean that the devil is divided against itself, like the, 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 the house of devilhood, if you want to put it this way, uh, would be in some kind of inner conflict, one devil driving out the other. Um, and then the, the whole kingdom will not stand. So um, it's clear that he is against the devils.
And in a similar way, we can say that the Quran, uh, by saying "Fasta'id billahi min shaitan al-rajim," is telling Muslims seek protection from uh, shaitan, the rejected one, and always to shun the devil. Be watchful that that the biyukhutubat shaitan do not follow the footsteps of the devil, and so on. So the Quran is assuring us that this is a message from God. It is not from the devil, and in fact, we should seek protection from the devil. Okay, verse number twenty-eight. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. How can anyone enter a strong man's house and steal his property unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me uh, scatters. Uh, so probably what Jesus means here is that, you know, if he's driving out the demons, that means uh, that the demon is under control now. Satan is under control and, uh, you know, he, he cannot stand against uh, the prophet and messenger of God. Okay, verse number 31. Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, if you think about that carefully, uh, the Trinitarian doctrine says that there is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the three are co-equal and co-eternal. Now, if, uh, if that is the case, then why would it be blasphemy uh, uh, to, uh, like, why, why would the blasphemy against the Spirit uh, not, not be forgiven, but the blasphemy against the Son will be forgiven? So, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. That, uh, the, the better explanation for this would be that when the Spirit is spoken about here in this particular context, uh, the Spirit is another way of referring to God himself. So it's not another person of God, it's just another way of referring to the Father. And so the, the blasphemy against the Father, that is, the, the Spirit, uh, will not be forgiven. But any other kind of blasphemy will be forgiven. You blaspheme against angels, you blaspheme against any of the creatures of God, you blaspheme against the one who is called here the Son of Man. All of that will be forgiven. Why? Because only the Father is God, and the Father is referred to as the Spirit here. So blasphemy against the Spirit, which means blasphemy against the Father, that will not be forgiven, but blasphemy against all else will be forgiven. So th that's simple. So that means that uh, from this verse, <coughs> we can deduce uh, that the Trinitarian doctrine is not with, uh, with proper foundation. Uh, now we come to the section entitled The Tree and Its Fruits. So we'll get to the end of this chapter and then I'll take your questions and comments and we'll wrap up soon, inshallah. Okay, a tree and its fruits. Uh, verse number 33. Either declare the tree good and its fruit is good or declare the tree rotten and its fruit is rotten for a tree is known by its fruit. Uh, you brood of vipers, how can you say good things when uh, you are evil? For from the fullness of the heart of the mouth, uh, from, from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good person brings forth good uh, out of a store of goodness, but an evil person brings forth evil out of a store of evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will render on account, an account for every careless word they speak. Uh, by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Uh, th this reminds me, uh, you know, where Jesus says, uh, for every care careless word you speak, uh, it, it, it reminds me of a verse of the Quran, مَا يَلْفِذُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَخِيبٌ عَتِيد So, uh, whatever word escapes the person's mouth, there is an angel uh, who is ready to, uh, you know, record that and, and, uh, and, and keep a record of that. Okay, so coming now to the next uh, subject heading, the demand for a sign. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. 
He said to them in reply, An evil and unfaithful generation seeks a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. I want to pause right here. So this sign of Jonah, uh, the, the best explanation for the sign of Jonah is not that it has to do with three days and three nights, but uh, uh, going back to the earliest form of this saying, which is uh, thought to be in the Q Gospel, uh, the sign of Jonah, according to the German scholar Dieter Zeller, uh, must mean that Jesus was rescued alive. Um, now, to uh, take it further, look at the details of this, the three days and the three nights. Well, it, it, some have said that this is a gloss, which means that somebody must have written this maybe in, a, in the margin, and then eventually it got included in the... Uh, gospel itself as people copied and copied like sometimes somebody writes something in the margin this called a gloss and then eventually it is uh, included by the next person who uh, copies and it means that we've lost the copies uh, that did not include this uh, statement about the three days and the three nights that it is a gloss has been mentioned in the abandoned bible commentary so i'm not making that up um but if one were to insist now, this is the way the gospel is, this is how the early manuscripts read, so we have to accept it was three days and three nights. Now everyone can see that it wasn't three days and three nights, uh, the time that Jesus is said to have spent in the tomb, because he was put there on a Friday evening, just before the start of the Sabbath, and then by Sunday morning, the women had come there and they found the tomb to be empty. So uh, sometime during that Saturday night, uh, he must have, uh, at the latest, he must have left the tomb. So at most, he spent uh, all the night of uh, of uh, Saturday, all night of Friday, like the night following Friday, all that night, then all of the day of Saturday, and then part of the Sunday, uh, the, the night preceding Sunday, that is the night following Saturday. So at most, he spent like two day, two nights. And one day, and if you want to add, you know, uh, the few minutes or so from the uh, last uh, moments of Friday before the start of the Sabbath, you can say, okay, part of, of two days, uh, like, you know, one day and a part of a day, and then one night and a part of a night, something of this uh, nature. But you're not going to get three days and three nights. Now, some people say, well, you know, when people spoke in those times about... Um, you know, they, they use this kind of approximate language when they said three days and three nights. They, they don't mean literally three days and three nights. But uh, to to um, validate that claim, or they give examples of somebody saying three days. And, and those examples do not really uh, fit the bill because there is a certain emphasis here. As, the, as Jonah was in the belly, three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth, three days and three nights. So th there is a sort of emphasis here, which is not in those examples. And sometimes they bring an example from the book of Esther. So Queen uh, Esther uh, had, um, you know, she, she, she uh, had pledged a fast uh, for three days. And then on the third day, she went uh, to, um, you know, present her um, requisition to the king. Uh, so one might get the impression, okay, so she fasted three days uh, and then, you know, she, uh, hope that the, in pledging the fast for three days, it might have been intended that she will go like on the fourth day and then she goes on the third day. But maybe that's not was, what was intended. Maybe they, what was intended is that you, fa you pledge the fast for three days and then on the last day, while you are still uh, within the fast period, uh, you make the requisition. It's almost like Muslims, they're fasting from morning till evening. And then close to the time of breaking the fast, Muslims understand this is a good time to be uh, making your supplications to God because your prayers are more likely to be answered now. Why? Because it's not because you've completed the duty, you're near completion. Uh, but, but you haven't actually completed it yet, and you're, you're making uh, your supplication to God in that state in which you are, in a way, you are stricken with hunger, and uh, you're doing this for the sake of God, you are in the self-deprivation uh, for the sake of God, and you're still within that condition. As opposed to like after you've finished eating and uh, now you are happy and you know you're not in the same state of mind you don't have that same humility before god 
uh, with which you might offer a prayer before the fasting ends. So it must be something like this, that Queen Esther uh, pledged the fast for the three days. He, she did completed the two days. And then on the third day, while she's still within the period of fasting, while she's still hungry, and while she's still humble before God, this is when she uh, makes her requisition to the king, knowing that God is listening and God will bring about whatever they are requesting. So uh, this uh, story of Queen Esther in the book of Esther does not prove uh, that by saying three days and three nights, you could mean less than three days. Um, first of all, it doesn't say three days and three nights. Uh, and secondly, it doesn't say that this is the completion of the three days uh, that, were, that were pledged. It means that they uh, were able to present their requisition before the fast is actually complete. So here we have a difficulty that some have um, acknowledged. And as I said, the Abingdon Bible commentary just plainly says that this is a gloss, the mention of three days and three nights here. So uh, removing the mention of three days and three nights, we have the sign of Jonah, which is uh, uh, present uh, here in, in uh, both Matthew and Luke. And so this is uh, said to come from the Q Gospel. And uh, some scholars say that uh, you know, Jonah uh, died in, in the whale, but uh, many others say that Jonah was alive. And uh, if Jonah was alive in the whale, then uh, Jesus' um, similarity with Jonah would mean that Jesus was also alive uh, in the belly of the earth. And as Jonah was rescued alive, uh, Jesus was also rescued alive. Um, okay, so verse number 41. At the judgment, the men of Nineveh will arise with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Uh, I'll, I'll read to the end of the chapter and then I'll take your questions and comments. And there is something greater uh, than Jonah here. And that's in verse number uh, 41. So uh, now Jesus is greater than Jonah. Uh, okay, so th that doesn't mean that he's God. And in fact, if he wants to say that he's God, he wouldn't just be simply be saying that he's greater than Jonah. He'd be saying that he's greater than everything else. Just like Muslims say, Allahu Akbar, by which they mean Allahu Akbar min kulli shay. Allah is uh, greater than everything else. Uh, that, uh, so uh, his saying that he's greater than Jonah means that he's in that category. He is a prophet, but he's a greater uh, prophet. And in fact, he didn't only say something about that, uh, like that about himself. Uh, he also uh, praised, uh, in a previous chapter, you will recall, he praised uh, John the Baptist and said that, uh, you know, he's greater than the prophet. So John the Baptist is greater than the prophet. Jesus is greater uh, than Jonah. And of course, we've already seen that uh, by Jesus's own declaration, uh, John the Baptist is greatest of all of those who have been born of women. And by this time, Jesus obviously was already born of a woman. So John the Baptist himself is said to be greater than, than Jesus by that logic. And uh, while, while this is not a Muslim uh, declaration, uh, nonetheless, it is a logical implication from what is mentioned in the Bible. Okay, verse number 42. At the, at the judgment, the queen of the south will arise with the generation and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and there is something greater than Solomon here. And so this is a reference to the queen of Sheba and we have her story in the 27th chapter of the Quran. In fact, I mentioned her story in my Friday sermon and uh, the record of that is uh, on my Facebook page. Uh, you might want to uh, listen to that. So I don't want to stop now. Uh, let me um, continue. So, mm. so the people of Nineveh repented and, um, y you know, that, that was good for them and they will fare better uh, than uh, the present generation because the present generation are listening to uh, the people are listening to Jesus, but they're not uh, repenting. So those who repented will be in a better position and they um, will rise to condemn the present generation. Because uh, as, as we know in, a Muslim, in Muslim theology, there is an understanding that those who have received the message will bear witness against the people who uh, did not rally to the message because they will be able to say, look, the messengers came, they preached to us and so on. We know the message and uh, there's no excuse for somebody to uh, reject the message that comes from God through his 
messengers. So they will arise to condemn this nation. Uh, what this all means is that the repent repentance of the people is what saved them. The people of Jonah were saved by their repentance. It's not by somebody dying for their sins. Now we come to this um, section about the return of the unclean spirit. When an unclean spirit, this is verse number 43 now, when an unclean spirit goes out of a person that roams through arid regions searching for the rest but finds none, uh, searching for rest but it finds none, then it says, I will return to my home from which I came, but upon returning he finds it empty, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and brings back with itself seven other spirits, more evil than, than itself, and they move in and dwell there. Uh, and dwell there. And the last condition of that person is worse than the first. Thus, it will be with this evil generation. So this parable is not easy for me to fathom. What does Jesus mean here? Uh, so you drive out a spirit from the person. The person cleans up his, his house, meaning his own body, his self. And then he gets seven other spirits. It doesn't seem so fair to the person because it looks like the person was doing his best to uh, not have evil spirits. He wanted to be clean. And yet he gets... Um, uh, more evil spirits. So whether that in fact happens or not, that's another question. Do spirits inhabit, inhabit people like this and take control of their bodies and speak through them? Uh, that, that's a different question. But how will it be with this evil generation? It may be that, that, that what Jesus is hinting at here is that a prophet comes, he preaches to them, uh, they clean up their act, uh, then uh, in the meantime, um, you know, they, they, they get evil deeds cropping up among them, evil practices, deviations, and so on, and then another prophet has to come to them. But it's not so very clear to me. Uh, I have to admit, this one is an obscure parable, and maybe somebody here will be able to explain that one. Uh, so I'll look in your comments. Maybe I'll find you the, the explanation there. Okay, the true family of Jesus. Now we're coming to the last, three, uh, last uh, four ver or five verses here in this section. The true family of Jesus. Who are his true family? Verse number 46. While he was still speaking to the crowds, his mother and his brothers appeared uh, outside wishing to speak with him. <clears throat> Someone told him, <clears throat> Your mother and... Uh, the brothers are standing outside asking to speak with you. Uh, but he said in reply to the one who told him, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my heavenly father is my brother and sister and mother. Well, uh, th that brings us to the end of that chapter. And I should uh, say here that it's a nice thing that Jesus is able to include uh, his audience uh, as family and say, okay, those who follow me, they are like, they're, you know, they are my mother and brother and, and, and sister um, and, and father. <clears throat> they're they my brother and sister and, and uh, mother, whoever does the will of my heavenly father. But for him to, in a way, disown his actual mother and, and brothers, uh, this, uh, this requires uh, some explanation. Um, why would he be doing that? Uh, think about Mary, if not his brothers. Like, okay, so we don't know that much about his brothers. But think about Mary. Her story as told in the Quran and told in the Gospel according to Luke. Mary is very special. And she gets a visitation from the angel who informs her that she will have this son who will be special. So why would Mary not be a believer of course she would be a believer and and if the believers are his uh, you know mother and and brother and sister well certainly mary is included but uh, this is a hangover from mark's gospel uh, matthew is obviously copying mark's gospel here according to the majority of uh, scholars who work on what is called the synoptic problem and they see the literary relationship between matthew and mark so uh, mark is starting from that perspective that the disciples are not the true uh, interpreters of Jesus. To find the true interpreter of Jesus, we have to look to a person like Paul, who uh, he was teaching some doctrines which uh, were novel, uh, like the doctrine that Jesus died for the sins of the world, and that Jesus is this special uh, agent of God by whom all things were created, and so on. So if, if one took that route and, and went with Paul, uh, then 
one, one steered away from the disciples of Jesus. And so there is this tension uh, among some early Christians. Some are followers of Paul, some are followers of Peter. Uh, Peter being, uh, you know, the chief disciple, the, the most uh, famous among the disciples, or at least the most prominent one, it would seem, because in Matthew's Gospel itself, Peter is said to be the rock on which Jesus builds his church. Uh, so, and we'll come to that later in chapter 16, God willing. So for the meantime, uh, you have this kind of division, some people following Paul, some people following Peter, and the rest of the disciples, and so to the family of Jesus. So if you want to go with Paul, then you want to say the family of Jesus and his original disciples, they are not the true interpreters. Uh, we're, we're going to find the true believers. And of course, for them, true believers mean people like Paul and, and others who uh, were following a particular line of interpretation. And so the disciples of Jesus and even his family get a bad rap in, in, the, in the Gospels, starting with Mark's Gospel, and then a certain hangover of that is found in Matthew's Gospel as well. Uh, though Matthew's Gospel uh, does not have it as, uh, as strong, because we find in Matthew's Gospel there's the, uh, you know, celebration of Peter as the rock on which the church will be built and so on. So those are my comments uh, on uh, Matthew chapter 12. Inshallah, in the next, uh, in a future meeting, we'll move on to deal with chapter 13. So for the time being, let me look at your questions and comments. And um, I want to thank all of those who shared the stream, including Miftahuddin Muhammad uh, and uh, Brother Mikhail White and uh, Brother Ilyasu, and uh, again, Brother Muhammad, Mustafa, and Al-Haji, uh, Abu Bakr. Uh, so, looking at your comments, um, so I see that uh, there is naturally salam from many of you. Uh, Muhammad Dawood saying salam from Ghana. MashaAllah, may Allah SWT bless you and all the people of your country, of Ghana and elsewhere. May Allah SWT bless you all and keep you all safe. So, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all of you who have said salam and um, uh, to come back to Islam. May Allah bless you as well. And from Bangladesh, mashallah, it's nice to know that my message is getting across around the world. I like when I see that people have joined from other countries and you tell me what countries you're from. Um, I do appreciate that. Uh, so, Dennis is uh, saying chapter 12 with the sign of Jonah. Um, okay, so Dennis, I don't know if you meant that for me or you were just informing somebody else where we were reading. I'm not really sure what you meant. Please, if there's something else that I'm missing there, please let me know. Okay, so Dennis uh, asks as well or says, in Israel there are, or at least were, some time ago, elevators that stop on every floor on the Sabbath. Uh, so nobody needs to do the work to press the button for the floor they want to go. So humans sometimes really exaggerate. Yeah, so uh, Dennis, interesting information. I didn't know that that existed. And, um, you know, I don't say anything here to uh, to criticize our Jewish friends for their interpretation. Uh, it is obvious that interpretations like these are given in good spirit by people who really want to follow God and obey him uh, to the letter. Uh, however, we see that in Islam as well, where people are trying to obey to the letter. And I say to people, don't try to follow the letter always uh, when this will be detrimental or where it might even make the uh, the command look unreasonable. The command itself may look unreasonable. You know, if you're doing something uh, in, in a meticulous way down to a detail that people will look at and say, you know, why are you doing that? That makes no sense. And then you say, well, God told me to do this. Then you're making God look unreasonable. So I say to our Muslim friends, uh, at least, you know, please understand uh, the laws of God in a, in a general way and see the spirit of it. Sometimes, yes, it's uh, important to follow the letter otherwise if everybody says i'm following the spirit of law and then they just do their own thing then in, in, nobody would really be following people would just be following their own desires but be careful and draw that line between following your own desires and following too literalistically that will make the law itself look very odd in the eyes of people okay uh dennis uh in israel there are Okay, I think I read that comment already, so I'm going to move on from that. Okay, so Salmi saying Assalamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and Brother Omar and Nizam saying, question, is there good reason to believe that Luke Acts was most written, uh, most likely written in the early 2nd century instead of the, 
instead of the first century. Uh, yes, yes, at least with Acts of the Apostles. I'm not so convinced about the Gospel of according to Luke itself. So first of all, let me uh, give some context to this. So everybody's on the same page with this. Brother Omar, you seem to be to have um, read up on this. Most people may not be familiar because most uh, of what we're familiar with is uh, what reached a certain uh, level of consensus among the uh, scholarly bodies. They think that Luke was written around the year 80 to 90. Uh, that means some 50 years after uh, Jesus had left the scene. Uh, but uh, in, in recent times, there have been some scholars like Richard Purvo and, and many others um, who have written about this and they have gone into great detail to show that uh, Luke's Gospel uh, and Acts of the Apostles uh, must have been compiled in the early 2nd century. And um, in fact, uh, the late Marcus Borg had the same idea. Um, so they, they lumped the two together, but, but their proof to show that this was written later uh, most applies to me, as I can see, applies to the uh, Acts of the Apostles, not so much to the Gospel itself. And why does it have to apply to the Acts of the Apostles? Because uh, historical details that are known from uh, Josephus' works uh, are, are found in the Gospel according, in, in the Acts of the Apostles. And so it is thought that at least the Acts of the Apostles must have been written after Josephus' writings because it seems to be dependent upon Josephus' writings and God knows best. So that's basically the reasoning behind it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, coming to Dennis uh, again, in our view, the Act Book of Acts was finished in the year 61. Uh, okay, so I know that some conservative um, Christians would place the Acts of the Apostles very early, and Matthew's Gospel even earlier, maybe around the year 41. Uh, but most scholars, I, I, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, Dennis, most scholars will place the Gospel according to Mark around the time of the Jewish War, some, somewhere between 66 to 70, some will say even 75 uh, after the uh, war. And uh, so it, it, it war is written about in hindsight. And then Matthew and Luke being dependent upon Mark are written somewhat later, maybe in the 80s or 90s. And God knows best. And then Acts of the Apostles being the second volume, following from uh, the Gospel according to Luke, would have been written sometime uh, after that, perhaps not long after that. Okay. Um, and then we come to Omar Nizam question two. Uh, are the Mushrikun of the Quran referring to pagans, polytheists, or are they most likely, more likely uh, monophysite Christians? That is, Christians who thought Jesus had two natures instead of one unified nature. So, uh, Brother Omar, it seems that uh, the term Mushrikun in the Quran is not used to refer to uh, Jews and Christians. Even Christians who had uh, a variety of beliefs which are very different from Muslim beliefs and different from each other among Christians. Uh, so the term Mushrikun is used to refer to the Meccans, the pagans in Mecca, whereas the Christians are referred to as Ahlul Kitab. I'm trying to be brief because I want to end a bit early today, so please forgive me for that. I need to uh, do something at 1.30, so I need to finish. Uh, by that. Okay. Akin Shippo, uh, I, ho I hope I uh, pronounced your name correctly. Please forgive me for any mispronunciations, all of you folks out there uh, saying salam, wa alaikum salam. And Omar Nizam is question three. How important is it to know about the Christological deb debates of the fifth century and to get a better understanding of Islam and the Quranic uh, message? Well, I think those who are in, in, uh, engaged in giving dialogue, in dialogue with and in debates with and giving dawah to our Christian friends, it is important for us to know something about those Christological debates because then we can help our Christian friends to see through those debates and the aftermath of it. So our, many of our Christian friends have, in, uh, have inherited a creed which comes as a result of all of these debates. So it is important to show them how it all came together and how Jesus came to be proclaimed as, as God. So they can see that history and they can realize that this is not coming straight out of their Bibles as they were led to believe, but it is actually coming through a long process of thinking that lasted many hundreds of years. Okay, Salmi uh, saying, Brother Shabir uh, Ali, maybe you can explain chapter 12 verses uh, 38 and 39 and 40 on the sign of Jonah. Uh, see here, proof that Jesus was not crucified as uh, a Christian claims. Uh, so, uh, well, 
uh, yeah, if we tease that further, as I mentioned, Dieter Zeller, a German scholar, uh, wrote that uh, it's um, uh, what seems to be at play here is that Jesus is saying that uh, the sign of Jonah is there and the sign of Jonah is that somebody is rescued alive. And that would mean that Jesus on whom be peace was rescued alive. Um, um, Mark Smith, Mark Smith, I hope I remember, Daniel Smith, Daniel Smith, not Mark Smith. Daniel Smith has written uh, about this in his book, The Post-Mortem Vindication of Jesus in the, Gosp in the Saints Gospel Q. He has cited Dieter Zeller uh, in, about this. Now, Mark, uh, Daniel Smith's idea is that uh, the sign of Jonah here could mean that Jesus uh, died and then he was taken maybe from the tomb. Uh, but um, uh, the, um, it was, this was taken further by uh, Dieter Zeller. And I'm going by memory here, which is a little bit vague now because I didn't prepare to, so much to talk about this whole subject of crucifixion, which I've addressed elsewhere. But uh, Daniel Smith's book is an interesting read in that, uh, 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 in that vein. And yes, I would agree with you that uh, we have here some evidence that uh, Jesus uh, may not have been killed uh, on the cross. Perhaps he was taken down alive put in the tomb, and then from the tomb, God uh, raised him up into heaven, and that's why his tomb was found empty, if we were to give credence to the narratives as much as we can in, in the Gospels. Okay, and um, we have here um, from Dennis. Yes, so, wow, so much stuff in chapter 12. What is a sin uh, against the Holy Spirit? Here, a parallel verse in Hebrews chapter 4, Verses 4 to 6, as uh, for as regards those who were once enlightened and who have tasted the heavenly free gift and who have become partakers of Holy Spirit and who have tasted the fine word of God and powers of the coming system of things, but have fallen away, it is impossible to revive them again uh, to repentance. So uh, having once gotten the guidance and they fall away, then it is uh, impossible to revive them again to repentance. Of course, uh, Dennis, uh, from a Muslim point of view, we would say that uh, it is still possible and one should not lose hope in the mercy of God. Uh, but probably this was written from the perspective of trying to, you know, warn people against falling away in the first place. So there's a warning that is very severe against falling away before you fall away. But if the person has fallen away, we should give them a message of hope and try to bring them back. And it's still possible. Okay, Omar Nizam, a question four. Given that all of Arabia was surrounded by Christian communities by the late uh, 6th century, Byzantine, um, Melkites, Persians, Sassanid, uh, Nestorians, Egyptian, Monophysites, um, Assyrian, Jacobites, and uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Christians, is it time to re-examine if Mecca was in fact a polytheistic uh, city? Uh, so, uh, do you mean to suggest, Omar, that uh, they might, like Mecca might have been like teeming with, with Christians uh, by this time, who were of, of a variety? Um, so Now, some scholars have done studies on this, on the question of polytheism in Arabia, and I'm not fully read up on all of what they have written about, but you might be interested in looking at what uh, Patricia Krohn, for example, has written about the polytheistic, uh, uh, you know, the idea that, of polytheism in that time. Uh, so I'm sorry that I cannot get into more detail uh, with you about this at this time, partly because I want to remain brief and I want to end uh, a bit quickly today. I apologize to you all for that, uh, for being curt in answering your questions. Uh, but uh, still, the Quran is speaking about polytheists who were, um, you know, taking others for God along with God at that time. Uh, and, and that most fittingly is a reference to uh, the pagan Arabs at the time. And yes, there were Christians as well. And to a certain extent, that might apply to them as well, especially some of them who had some uh, more blatant... Um, uh, ways of ascribing a partner to God. Okay, Dennis. Dennis uh, saying, regarding the three days and three nights, these are not full three days and three full nights. Uh, part of Friday, full Saturday, and part of Sunday. Also, how do we understand day and night? Both can be understood as one half of a day or as a 24-hour uh, uh, period. And again, these are not three full 24-hour uh, uh, periods. Okay, so Dennis, I've explained my view on that during the presentation, so I won't go over it now, but I appreciate your humble contribution in this uh, regard, 
and thank you for offering your thoughts. Oh, okay, Omar Nizam, question five. Do you favor the two source theory of the synoptic pro problem? Uh, that is Mark, pri Mark and priority with Matthew and Luke independently using Mark or the Farrer hypothesis that is Luke making use of both Mark and Matthew without a, any hypothetical Q gospel. Now I am attracted to the uh, two source uh, theory uh, with Mark using, uh, um, sorry, with Matthew and, and, and Luke using both Mark and Q. However, I'm aware that in recent times there were some who have tried to uh, revive the Farrer hypothesis, and um, we'll see how that goes. I'm, I'm not ruling it out completely. Uh, I don't ha have any need to insist on the existence of the Q Gospel as a written source. Uh, but uh, some scholars have uh, pointed out that once we know that Matthew and Luke were working with Mark, uh, then uh, if you posit that they were working with, of, you know, for the Q uh, type sayings on, on not necessarily a written Q gospel, but other traditions and so on, well, the more you study those traditions, the more they resemble a gospel which can be called Q. So I don't believe that those who are trying to revi revive the Farrer hypothesis have been able to sway uh, the opinion of the body of scholarship so far, but nonetheless, they are an important uh, voice to listen to and to study as well. So I recommend in this way uh, the writings of Mark Goodacre. He seems to be a very capable scholar and very detailed in his uh, work. Dennis uh, is saying, in our view, Jonah was not dead. Still, it says in Jonah 2.2, out of the depths of the grave, I cried for help. So this would have become the grave of Jonah without the miracle of God. Um, in any case, in case in case of Jesus, the miracle was even greater. It is not so strange that the sign for something to happen is not yet as great as the fulfillment. Well, uh, Dennis, uh, I, I Muslim may be able to come back at this and say, well, you know what? If Jonah was alive in the grave and yet he could use this language, which would seem to suggest that he had actually died then uh, that would explain a lot more. Uh, so, so Jesus could have been alive, and yet there is some expression in, in the New Testament and in the Gospels in particular, some expressions which uh, might give the impression that Jesus was dead, but in fact he wasn't dead. He was just as alive as Jonah was, was alive. But of course, this is a matter of dispute between Muslims and Christians. I recognize that, and I'm not taking issue with you here, Dennis. I'm just pointing out uh, this this uh, this this other view. Okay, Ziaul Haq uh, saying salam from Nigeria. Mashallah, may Allah subhanahu wa taala bless you, my brother Ziaul Haq. You have a very famous name, and uh, may Allah subhanahu wa taala bless you and all of the people around you, uh, all of the people of Nigeria and elsewhere. Abdul Malik uh, saying assalamu alaikum, doctor, and uh, walaikum salam, my brother Abdul Malik, and Hamza Hamza saying salam, Sheikh, uh, uh, walaikum salam, my brother Hamza, and you're asking how I am. Alhamdulillah, and I pray that you and all of the, your loved ones are doing fine. Uh, Hamza saying, Sheikh, can you please make dua for me? I have just started university and could you pray that Allah saves me from temptation and allows me to be successful? My young brother Hamza, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you every success uh, with your university program. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you in every way from every temptation. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you on all of the Muslim youth who are studying and everywhere. I just uh, was uh, a, an article from the New Yorker magazine was brought to my attention twice um, by people sending me and saying, you know, look what's happening. And uh, I, I can understand why you need my uh, du'as, my brother, uh, having read that article. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you and all of the young people uh, out there. May Allah save you all from every temptation. Okay, Hamza Hamza saying, Sheikh, can you do a Facebook post series on either Tafsir of Quran or Sirah of the Prophet? I ask this because due to our selective approach to Hadith, we would benefit knowing which aspects of the Sirah are authentic or not. Jazakallah. Okay, thank you for that suggestion by Hamza Hamza. Uh, in fact, uh, over time I have done uh, some uh, Zoom meetings with uh, the local community in the Toronto area. Um, since the pandemic started, you know, I get meant online with all of these things. So I did some tafsir and currently I'm doing some um, 
a commentary on the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, with the community. But eventually I will do this in a Facebook post as well for a wider audience. And uh, may Allah SWT bless us all. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. Um, so uh, Jamal Kusher uh, sending me his love and my love to you as well. My brother Jamal, may Allah SWT bless you, all of the people around you. Hamza Hamza saying, Sheikh, two girls came up to me yesterday attempting to convert me to Christianity and good on them. Uh, however, uh, due to the knowledge I have acquired from listening to you, they left in a hurry. Okay, interesting story. May Allah SWT bless you and protect you and all of the Muslims. All right, uh, Hamza Hamza Sheikh, regarding uh, tattoos and eyebrows uh, shaving. I know you reject this hadith due to the punishment being too strong for such a minor act. However, is it not better to say, example, eyebrows were shaved at the time of the Prophet by prostitutes, as some have said, and say the prohibition no longer stands? My brother Hamza Hamza, I wasn't aware that some have said that this was done by prostitutes. So if you have some information on that, please send it my way. You have my email address. Please uh, email me with that info, and I'll be grateful uh, for that. And then I'll be probably able to comment more than what I've already said before. And I'm trying to be brief here, so please forgive me for that. And then is saying, thanks, Shabir. I always appreciate your humble comments and your patience to go through all of the comments, even though they are off topic sometimes. Thank you, my friend, Dennis. And uh, it's always good to see you here. And uh, I appreciate when I see that uh, persons who are uh, not necessarily of my faith, uh, but they're they're here and, and listening to what I have to say. I know it's not easy to listen to people uh, who uh, may voice opinions that are not in line with our own. We, we tend to, uh, you know, um, rally to, with those who are speaking the same language as us and in the same tune as us. And I appreciate your patience in being here and uh, listening to me. So um, please forgive me if I say anything that is uh, off-putting or in a way that is off-putting. Uh, that's never meant. Uh, I try my best uh, to be humble and kind uh, to our listeners. Uh, but sometimes, you know, one can be carried away by zeal and emotion. Uh, so I seek forgiveness for all of that. And uh, Hamza Hamza saying Jazakallah for your time. And Jazakallah to all of you for being here with me. You've been an inspiration to me uh, to continue this humble work. And I thank all of those who shared the post, uh, um, including Ilyasin, if I didn't mention your name before, and Miftah ad and uh, Mikhail White, and Ilyas Abu Hassan, uh, Al Hassan and Muhammad uh, Mustafa and Al Haj Abu Bakr Mustafa. Thank you all for doing that. May Allah SWT bless you all. May Allah protect all of your loved ones and everyone in your various countries. And may Allah save the entire world from COVID 19, from every other sickness, disease, and stress and uh, distress. Uh, I say a prayer for the new King of England. May Allah guide him uh, to do what is best uh, for uh, people everywhere, people in his country, people in all of the colonies that are controlled uh, by uh, the UK, uh, and especially for Muslims there and everywhere else. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Uh, please uh, help my work by donating. Go to our website, islaminfo.com. Click on the donate button and that's where you can send us a donation to help our mission. Jazakumullah khairan. Join me again next week, inshallah, same time, right here. Peace be with you. Fiyamanullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.